My name is Tony Gonzalez, and we are here because in April 2023, Joe Landy uh, will be touring Spain, presenting his more recent CD, Over the Horizon Radar. How are you, Joe? I'm fine, thank you. It's going to be uh, great. You know, I always uh, love Spain. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, warm people, uh, everything with Spain. It's always uh, fascinating uh, history. Um, but most of all, the climate and the food and the wine, of course. Yeah, I think to Scandinavians, uh, Spain has always been, you know, on top of the list of places to go to or even to live. <laughs> Still, and, and I'm lucky to have a lot of friends there, a lot of uh, music lovers. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and uh, it's going to be great, man. Yes, but let me tell you that even when I live in Spain, I was born in Cuba. Oh, the Caribbean island. Even when you have never been there as a singer, maybe you were as a tourist, uh, the people know you and your records are very well appreciated too. I didn't know. I didn't know that. And the closest I got to Cuba was uh, Cancun in Mexico. I was like on the tip there and I was kind of looking across and I'm thinking, okay, somewhere just right over there is is cuba and um actually cuba is, is quite fascinating with with the you know all the what's well, kind of turbulent the history that you have there but still you know it's it's a beautiful country and it's, it's special with the also with the, all the american cars from the 50s still in the streets i mean i think that's some of the more like commercial <laughs> when you memorize and, and think about your country you think about uh, this this Great, the great country with with the warm-hearted people. It's kind of a, a distant thing, I think, for 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 Europeans, uh, especially Scandinavians, which I, I don't think too many people travel to Cuba as tourists, um, unfortunately. But uh, it's actually one of the places on my bucket list. People think that uh, when you're a touring artist, you 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 played everywhere, but but I mean, but you you know you you can't. Play everywhere. Rarely we play in uh, in countries like, uh, for example, India, in countries like Africa, uh, and then you have the islands and in, in, in places like Cuba, Russia. We played a few times in the past, but uh, not anymore, <laughs> not right now. So, uh, for obvious reasons, in China, I never, I, I played once in China, but that was um, in Beijing. But that was uh, with uh, this uh, League of Legends online gaming uh, concept uh, we have called uh, Pentakill which is a virtual metal band within the game League of Legends. So there was a, like a big thing going on there. We were, That was good, but, uh, you know, it's not a typical country to play rock and roll or metal in. So I was listening over the Horizon Brothers, and when I pay attention to the songs, I imagine a, a futuristic story, mostly uh, in the song title, uh, and that London, like War of the Wars, written, the novel written by A.G. Wells. I remember that even you used this sentence, the war of the wars. So yeah. things between the songs is a concept album. Well, it, it, it the album itself is not like one concept, but it, it's more like, uh, you know, reflecting uh, life uh, through uh, my own experiences and, and things that both fascinated me and, and, you know, when I grew up and at the same time things that I had left undone in life, you know, talking about Dead London, for example. It's and I, I had the idea to do a song. Um, actually, I had a few lines, a few melody lines and some bits and pieces of, of that lyric laying around. I, I mean, I've had it for years, but I never got to, to write a song about it. In my mind, I had some idea to make a whole record that was kind of like the War of the World thing, because we did in 2015, we did this uh, record, me and my former guitarist, uh, Trond uh, Holter. We did this record uh, by, by Bram Stoker's Dracula, mm -hmm. this record called uh, Dracula Swing of Death, which, um, you know, was kind of uh, something that uh, led to me thinking that I should do this War of the World thing. Uh, and I had this idea for Dead London to be the, the kind of the big thing, you know, to be the, the title of, of the album and everything. But, uh, you know, it all kind of changed with the years and it narrowed down to be, you know, 
one song for for one album you know and uh, things change you know in life but uh, i think you know everything was kind of packed into that song the whole world of the worlds kind of thing still it's not directly the war of the world it's just uh, influenced by that story i mean i remember when i grew up i used to listen to the old cassette war of the world album that was uh, out in the i must have been in the late 70s or something um this record i have maybe many released music from that um story or in concept but uh, uh, in particular that one uh, release that was i think probably the most famous one uh, i used to listen to it uh, at home, uh, you know, my parents' house, I used to listen to it in the evening when I uh, went to bed, you know, I went to school in the morning and stuff. And I remember at that age, we, we read books, especially in the 70s, books, you know, by Jules Verne, fascinated about futuristic stuff. And But we were kind of like old fashioned in a way, my generation, because we had like one foot in the early 1900s, 1800s, <laughs> and then had the modern thing going at the same time. So we were kind of close. I mean, I'm born in the late 60s. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean the Second World War was not that far away when I was a kid. You know, it was uh, still people uh, young enough to have uh, been a part or, or experienced uh, the war. So, so I and, and Dead London was this thing that I thought, you know, okay, maybe writing a song about uh, this is kind of something that's a bit retro in a way. Um, the same time i think you know retro is cool you know uh, we're, we're still young and we we, we I, mean, I mean i love this sci-fi stuff still um and the, the idea was cool and i think it's a good song i mean the uh, lyrics came out great and uh, it's always a challenge to write a song about something specific like a story to do that in three four minutes uh, it's a short uh, song uh, in a way for a big story um so the challenge is always to write something simple that uh, at the same time uh, uh, has some texture and, and, you know, gets brilliant somehow. Um, you know, be the Beatles used to write uh, Love, Love Me Do. You know, it's not really rocket science in that sense, but uh, it's actually uh, a big challenge to write simple lyrics that, are still, you know, good lyrics. And I, I always uh, find that challenging. And um, after the Dracula record we did together with my former guitar player, we, I, I felt like this is very cool, but it's actually more demanding to do, to write something specific about the story to make that really good, you know, and compared to just reflecting artistically on, on life, you know, and stuff like that. So, but with Dead London, kind of took me into this more specific story that actually more challenging than I expected. And I guess that's why also why the song was never really done many years ago. I, every time when we were working on a record, when I tried, I couldn't get, you know, things to work. And I felt kind of cool now, but it's not couldn't get the right words or the right uh, ideas coming to, to finish the song. And in the, in the pandemic was kind of a good, uh, you know, time to, to have some time off. I could actually spend some more time in my own universe uh, at home and I could sit down. That song was suddenly, you know, completed. And uh, <laughs> great song, Over the Rise and Radar uh, is another track, which is uh, one of my favorite tracks from that record. Um, that's actually inspired by an actual radar station in Australia. They have a radar program, which they've been working on for a long time. It's, it's uh, one of the most advanced or maybe even the most advanced uh, radar system in the world. They obviously picked up on the song and they, they loved the song. And that was great. Uh, was called the Over the Horizon Radar Program. That's why. Uh, and, and funny enough, the reason for discovering this uh, radar uh, concept was actually because uh, I saw the name Yorn on the internet. This radar station is called the uh, Jinda Lee Operational uh, Radar uh, Network. When when you shorten that down, that's Yorn. That was kind of the idea from the beginning. It started with something that was kind of funny because I thought, wow, <laughs> that's just funny. It's my uh, name or my artist name, and 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 it's uh, and they have this program called Over the Horizon Radar. Um, 
And so the idea started growing on me. And the same thing, this was also, you know, around the pandemic, was spending a lot of time with my own mind. Well, maybe one of the best or most interesting your own songs um, to date is the title track. And then it's Dead London. And then it's uh, um, a more classic song, that, uh, but a song I love a lot, which we also play live called uh, Ode to the Black Nightshade. Mm -hmm. Is uh, another one of my favorite. Uh, actually, th that song was. I mean, uh, uh, the Black Nightshade is is a is a plant. It's actually my wife, who, who who's a gardener, found this plant in the garden, and we were outside. Uh, we have a second house in Sweden, so we we were there and they're doing some work in the garden, and 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 she found this plant and said, Ah, oh, it's, it's a Black Nightshade, and I said, What well, Black Nightshade? Is that, is that a plant? So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. And then uh, I read more about the plant. It's a kind of it's been used for medicine. It's, it's can it can also be poisonous and dangerous. Um, so and it, it's known to take over in the garden, you know, to 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 overshadow other plants so that they won't get sun uh, stuff like this. And uh, I thought, well, there's some sim symbolic stuff going on with that plant. And so I transferred that to to life. All the challenges we have and the the, the darker shady sides of life um, you need the darkness to uh, to appreciate the light and so I, I i used that in as a metaphor and and wrote that song and so that i try to see the the dark aspects of life as something positive because it's the only way you can you know thrive on and and uh, find uh, good energy uh, and and never give up you know so it's so in the in a sense that the, the song is a is a homage or a tribute to all the challenges in life that you foresee. You need the, you need those to, to appreciate the good, you know, and the light. But you're, uh, we are rockers. We are not afraid of the dark. It's like Dio said, rainbow in the dark, right? Yes. So uh, now that we are talking about this, before Over the Horizon Radar, you mm. uh, released some years ago, Heavy Rock Radio, the, the first and the second. Yeah, the compilation Heavy Road Radio are finished or, or not at all. And if you are going to record another Heavy Road Radio, why not a cover of the Sweet, one of your favorite <laughs> bands? Yes. I love I love Sweet. It's actually Brian Conway. Maybe you saw this or heard me saying this before, but uh, Brian Conway was my number one singer next to Elvis. Uh, when I was a kid, so mid 70s, you know, in, in 73, when I was five, my father came home with the, the single Ballroom Blitz and Fox on the Run. And so, and from that moment on, I was trying to cut my hair like, or had my mom, because uh, she was actually a hairdresser, uh, cut my hair like Brian Connolly. And I, I didn't want to cut my hair in the, you know, had this kind of straight cut here when I had hair here. <laughs> well, And he was a hero to me at the time. And, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to be a fireman or a policeman or I'm going to be like Brian. He was a big uh, kind of like a mentor. Uh, and then after that, as I grew, I started listening to all the other bands from, you know, Uriah Heep to Rainbow and all the, the bands that came out of the 70s. Um, and, and then and on and on. Yeah, I was really lucky because my father's a musician and um, I was lucky to have a lot of albums in the house. Most people didn't listen to to the stuff that I listened to just because uh, my my father would would have all these albums at the house and he would play vinyls all the time. So I would uh, you know hear stuff like uh, Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull or um, you know Led Zeppelin stuff, you know, Communication Breakdown and songs like that. I would play a lot and so and that was kind of like a bit earlier than my age in a way or generation in a way because uh, it was more that even though I'm born in the late 60s I was it's kind of like I belong more to the the, the late 70s in a way but uh, musically I, I had all these uh, great albums uh, to listen to as a as a child I mean even the early Deep Purple stuff that was kind of obscure before the more commercial songs uh, or more typical rock songs by purple uh, It was more like fusion stuff and uh, you know experimental stuff I, i used to listen to a lot of that it's like um, the story asterix and obelix you know and yes. obelix he fell in he fell in the the potion you know so yes. it's kind of like i fell in the magic of the 
60s and 70s music and I picked up all these um, elements and uh, tried to you know find my own uh, way out of that and uh, I guess that's why I've been experimenting a lot throughout the years with various styles you know singing wise within rock and metal um, changing my expression a lot you know old records I did like Ark, Burn the Sun or some of the stuff I did with the, the German band I played with the old Master Plan and uh, the records I did Beyond Twilight was a concept album of, which I did also with a Danish um, keyboard player called uh, Finn Sealer and uh, a lot of experimenting and I transferred some of that as well onto my own uh, records and so early on records have uh, elements of that for example you know the Out to Every Nation record or World Changer I'm mean, a World Changer had a great drummer from from Mayhem called the Jan Axel Hellhammer uh, Lomberg, who, who plays drums of that. Not the typical drummer for that style. But I think we were in a situation where we wanted to do something new, uh, but still keep the classic roots. So Because it's kind of like in the 90s, it seemed like the classic rock thing was kind of... Um, going away a, a little bit or it wasn't the thing to you know if you wanted to get signed and have a career it wasn't the music style to play but then you know we were in our prime and we were kind of like getting up there and now we're gonna you know make a career for ourselves and all that so uh, but then you know you, it was hard to get record deals and I thought how do we do this we have to do something to keep the dream alive. You know, what we did is... So I think the compromise was for a while to, to put musicians together from, from different styles. Like uh, the songwriting was more classic, but you had like a drummer from the black metal scene, which made everything different again in the in, uh, within the band. So, so musically, we developed a new style within the classic rock uh, slash... Uh, heavy metal genre uh, or, or or we contributed to that thing happening uh, and uh, this was a similar thing we did also with, with Master Plan because um, at the time not many other bands did stuff like we did so it was kind of original you had this combo of uh, this German metal kind of power metal thing but then mixing that with, with the, the classic rock singer universe in a way so that combo was kind of um, something uh, special at the time and i think that's also why those first uh, couple of albums uh, when i was part of the band there uh, when we started out did quite well with, with those records and that kind of put uh, also me as a singer you know even more on the map internationally uh, because of you know billboard awards we got you know we got several awards for we sold a lot of records and it was kind of innovative uh, the whole thing i guess you know and and also uli and roland coming from halloween um helped of course a lot that you already had some following based on the, on their history so it was easier to open some doors in the business as well um with that but I think, you know, the music was the, the main thing, you know, you can't just come from something that's already famous and put together something and it's automatically famous. It has to be something special. So um, I think we did something brilliant there. And a lot of bands uh, seems to have taken uh, some inspiration from uh, some of those early records. What about a new heavy rock radio uh, CD? Yeah, uh, yeah well, uh, I'm working on it. Right now, actually, I um, already recorded, uh, or I work with my guitarist, uh, Adrian, um, and, uh, and my other guitarist as well, uh, Tore. Uh, but uh, mainly, Adrian lives not too far from me here, so we are you know, often uh, working together, uh, and then we send the stuff to my other guitarist, Tore. Tore is, is kind of like uh, the old... Old player of the band, Adrian is young player. You know, he's 25 and uh, he's on fire. And uh, yeah, could be my son. You know, so it's kind of uh, and it's funny because Tore, who's been with me for a long, long time, and we go way back. He he used to teach Adrian yes. to play 
but when Adrian was like 11 or something, he, he would take guitar lessons from Ture. So, and that's so funny. So, that, you know, the, the ring has uh, come full circle now. So when, when Adrian is, is suddenly, you know, playing in, in the band, so. Yes, talking about Ture, uh, tell me, how has this relationship got to be so solid for decades? Because you have been working with him more, 20, 20 years maybe or more. Yeah. Or yeah, more. I think first time was uh, in the 90s, uh, like 97 or something. Yeah, so, uh, I think first time. Uh, no, uh, it's just, you know, been, we've been on and off. It's been sometimes turbulent with the, you know, like normal, uh, like a, like in a family or a brotherhood, you know, it's, it's there's been some uh, some problems along the way, but, uh, you know, we, na we navigated through that and And so we left the band for a while and then we came back and then, you know, it's been a little bit like this. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, uh, we just found uh, back together all the time, you know. So, and then now it's more like for the last, I would say, you know, I don't know how many years now, but many years um, since, uh, which record? Yeah, like, 12 years or something at least uh, 10 12 years now it's been uh, quite quite solid um uh, so uh, but, you know it's always been like this i mean we, we we had sections in life where we did something else or we had some personal issue that you know some people get married some get kids and they want to have a break other people you know you know drink too much or uh, they're just uh, they need to get away from it or or, and, or some people just want to play in different bands yeah, anyway it, it's good the, the third uh, heavy rock radio rec will be out either later this year or, or uh, early 2024 uh, so uh, already did a few songs uh, are recorded for at least uh, 10 10, 12 tracks now. Um, after summer, we should be, you know, mixing the record or around that time, October. Could be a Christmas release or it could be a early 2024 release. So it would be good. But no, no Elvis Presley, no Sweet, no your favorite uh, bands when you were a kid? Yeah, well, I so far I haven't, uh, you know, uh, recorded any Sweet song, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> We had a list of songs, you know, a lot of songs, because, uh, um, I mean, this started as a as a project, uh, you know, with with you know, interpreting other people's songs, uh, doing uh, doing them yarn style. Um, I mean, it could have been a, a concept where you wrote everything and you called it heavy rock radio and you tried to make songs that were like fit for rock radio or whatever but uh, I, i thought you know this concept was the idea was to do already existing uh, classics um uh, the classics that we love um as well as some newer songs that we could uh, um uh, you know uh, change or make more heavy yes. in a natural way uh, some songs were actually uh, not really rock songs either so like the first heavy rock radio had uh, had this um, song uh, i know there's something going on which was a song on uh, frida from abbas solo record back in the 80s it was phil collins producing that album and um, i think he played drums also on on at least that song uh, it was kind of the song didn't have any heavy guitars but the riff uh, kind of uh, lends itself naturally to to rock guitar so and natural to do it and 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 funny enough uh, no one did it as far as i know before at least we couldn't find any version of it at the time it's like okay so this song done in this style why isn't it already done because it's a brilliant song and no yeah, okay then, then we'll do it and uh, so um, same was at the time with the running up that hill by kate bush which was uh, now it's all over the place uh, because of this stranger things uh, series and you know new generations love the song when we did the song uh, in 2016 it was you know it was a couple of versions i found on the internet but there wasn't 
a lot of uh, versions of that song and uh, especially not rock or metal versions. So it, it was kind of like with the choices was, uh, I loved Kate Bush anyway, since I was a kid, you know, I, uh, I was, uh, you know, in love with Kate when I was a teenager, you know, which had the, like the, what's it called? Never Forever or this album with Babushka on it. Both original choices at the same time, adding some uh, classic, uh, more obvious songs as well, which, uh, which we also did. So, and it became popular. The first record went billboard in the US and stuff. And uh, so record company asked for another one. And I said, okay, the second one uh, maybe wasn't as successful as the first one, but uh, I think, you know, it's still a cool uh, concept that I thought, you know, this should be at least a trilogy or it, or maybe it could even be more, but uh, we'll see. Now that you mentioned your favorite artist, you always mention that Ronnie James Dio helped you to take some decisions in your life. Yeah, I would like to remember those times and ask you about your memories related to Ronnie and what have you taken from his philosophy of life? Ronnie was always there working hard. I don't know what compromises he had to make in life. You know, that's kind of uh, private stuff also. Uh, but uh, he was one of those artists that... Uh, just to stay true to himself as much as possible throughout his whole career. And I guess also, that's also why the quality of, and, and, and the, the trademark that he, he, he represented was so strong and so powerful. Um, he was not like wandering off in various directions. I mean, his voice, I mean, he started, he could sing a lot of things with his voice easily. Um, Uh, and he did some of that in the pop scene when he was a pop singer, more uh, in the like late 50s, early 60s, uh, or when he was uh, when he was young. Uh, so he kind of started out in a different way, and then ended up be becoming one of the most powerful, you know, rock or metal singers uh, ever. So um, when he decided to do this um, in a different way. Uh, In the in this in the early 70s I think uh, when he uh, he he was so uh, determined all the way to to stay true to that expression that he found and the universe he wanted to work within and um, so he was solid uh, rocker all, all the way through and uh, Uh, and then there was not many compromises musically to, to what he, he did. So, I mean, it's a different time now. People work with different people. And, you know, at the time you could play in a band for a long time and you could, uh, uh, you know, do only one thing. Um, uh, you could tour, make records. And there was a different uh, thing, you know, physically selling vinyls and uh, cassettes and all that. And, um, And then digital platforms and diff different ways of <laughs> ripping people off, if you will. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, so it's more challenging, I think, now to find uh, your own uh, platform in life. Uh, it's, you have to be a multitasker on a high level now. Yes. You have to know technology or you need a great team around you to, to make sure the business works. You have to work more and you have to multitask more be a part of more projects, uh, singing on stuff or playing guitar on stuff or whatever, you know, all musicians have to be very uh, active uh, uh, in a different, on a different level than back in the day when you could focus more on one thing and build one brand. He was uh, in, an inspiration in that sense that uh, while other bands were like um, going more uh, commercial with things and selling out, He was, you know, part of it, but, and he maybe did some stuff there, you know, like people talk about the keyboards on Rainbow in the Dark, that it's a kind of commercial and, and, you know, but I think this is more as, this is just a little detail. It's a great arrangement anyway. So it, it fits the song. So it's kind of wrong to, to use that as a sellout point from an artist like Dio, because that was, it was perfect with that keyboard. And today it's, completely accepted i mean it's normal people would say dio also was more uh, focused on this uh, handcraft you know to be a craftsman in 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 the right way and um 
and this is also something that, uh, that me and my band are like going back to, or we went started going back to that way of thinking, you know, some years ago. Uh, that okay, the rest of the world is now going off with this uh, new internet uh, life, you know, and uh, we have to be a part of it somehow. But uh, uh, accept the fact that we come from a time when it was more uh, more work, you know, more physical connection between uh, songwriting and performing. And uh, that's what Dio also, um, also when I asked him questions a long time ago, it was to get some answers on that, you know, what, what did you do, you know? Yes. And uh, so I, I didn't really need to get advice in that sense. I just wanted to know, it was enough to know what he did in that sense. Um, I took inspiration from that and um, and tried to to think in a similar way. You know, at the same time, you know, new times, uh, new ways of uh, working. So you can't really do everything like uh, the generations before you did. You know, because you have to compromise on some things and and adapt to the times. Um, so, I, but I think you know he was probably the most important person in the music industry that was kind of. Uh, giving me something that would help me uh, choose my own direction and how to think. After I, I toured, uh, I played with Ingrid Malmsteen for a while in, in the US. I Two tours I did, actually, but uh, I just helped out, actually, because the, the, the singer was uh, leaving the band, or I don't know what happened. Something yeah. <laughs> uh, happened. Uh, but anyway, I was in Spain uh, playing, was touring in Spain, some shows there. And then uh, my drummer from uh, from the band Arc, John Macaluso, would give me a call if I could step in on short notice and, and fly to I don't remember where I flew to Salt Lake City or something. I think it was the first show I flew in to to, to do the tour. And uh, um, so in short notice, I came home uh, from Spain, and then I uh, just rehearsed. You know, I had this package sent to me. We, with express uh, mail and uh, you know uh, we didn't have any any files to be or any internet at the time mm -hmm. so I waited for this package to be sent and um, so I got uh, the songs there so I had maybe five six days or something before I left I had the, the songs I was going to sing and then I went on tour it was uh, that tour with when Dio uh, Played on the same tour, um, meet the guys there, and 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 hang out a little bit at uh, some of the hotels. And one one day when Dio came to the hotel bar, it was quite late in the evening. I think he had an Irish coffee uh, or something um, at the bar, and I asked him, you know, about stuff from Rainbow, from what happened, you know, when he left Sabbath, you know, uh, how it all. I mean, now it's all, you know, kind of documented, most of it in, in this uh, film that was made and all that. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of stuff that uh, that people don't know that he told me, you know, stuff that uh, was more private. But uh, the hard times, um, when he was, it was kind of uh, very uh, rewarding and uh, uh, I felt very, very, like, um, lucky that I could, you know, do this at the time, you know, being younger and all, and, uh, you know, still uh, being a bit insecure about my direction, you know, because at the time we were crossing over to the internet uh, era around the millennium. It was kind of like, you know, the rock metal thing was going down. I mean, all the all the shows that was played, I mean, even the Dio band, there was a lot of smaller clubs played. I mean, I think the biggest show we, we played when I was doing this tour with Envy and Dio there, there was a, I think biggest, I think it was the Roseland Ballroom, it was called, in New York, which was the biggest show. I think that was capacity, 3,000 people or something. But I think that was the, the biggest uh, show of the whole thing. The rest was more like, you know, House of Blues, you know, in various cities in Chicago and uh, touring the States everywhere, going, playing clubs and, and, and also um, outside the city on some industrial venues. It wasn't really a, a great time for rock and metal. It was um, kind of like, you know, just after the grunge era, you know, people were more into Rage Against the Machine and uh, 
you know, Pantera and, and, and stuff like that. I, I don't think it was till like 2003, four that this classic rock metal thing was kind of coming back. Now I can, uh, what I learned from Dio was that I don't have to compromise anymore uh, in the same way. And I started doing that even more um, because of Ronnie and uh, it kind of paid off and I'm, I'm, I'm happy I, I, I did what I did over the last 20, 20 years now. Uh, uh, and that I kind of experimented it, a lot was fine, but I did it as a, uh, as a way to you know find out who am I or what is my uh, strongest side you know as a as a, as a singer uh, uh, and as a person and so I needed to experiment a lot and the good thing is you know one thing I learned from uh, from Ronnie was that uh, the worst thing you your worst enemy in life is uh, bitterness uh, bitterness uh, comes often because you didn't follow your uh, dream mm. or dreams or or because you didn't you know do some of the things and you that you you dreamt of doing and and this is something that uh, i i thought you know okay so it's more important to follow that path that you you burn for than uh, and, and and i and i sacrificed a lot before i sacrificed a lot of material stuff uh, when i was younger i just wanted to to work as a musician and wanted to make a, a living uh, from it and uh, and now i'm very happy that i uh, you know when I, when I meet people from from school and now uh, and i say wow good to see you man you know and then they all say the same thing your it, it's so inspiring to see i wish i would have done the same like you you know uh, regardless of if they were musicians or if they were not, you know, it's just that they had a lot of things they wanted to do, but and then they usually said, tell me, well, I stayed here, you know, and I, I didn't really, you know, I started working in some place or I took over the, my father's store or <laughs> whatever. And mm-hmm. they, and they're not complaining. They're just saying that they, they regret a little bit that they, um, did not um, do some of the things when they were younger, you know, because now they always think about wanting to do some of the stuff, but it's more difficult now because you know how it is. It's, it's kind of... We need to say goodbye. It was a very nice conversation. You are a very nice uh, talker. When I drink coffee in the morning and uh, yeah, but it's great to see you. So yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for your time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Ed. See you, man. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.